Book of Amos. You know, the Lord called different people to be prophets from different time, in different times and with different uh, ministries. Isaiah was a priest, and he had uh, entrance into the king's court. Uh, Jeremiah was pretty much an outcast and, and almost executed a couple times during his ministry. Ezekiel was part of the captivity in Babylon and did some uh, interesting things in his ministry in proclaiming the Lord. And um, the Lord uses different people at different times. We're going to find out where Amos came from today. Um, the greatest prophet in the kingdom is identified as John the Baptist. Jesus tells us that there was no greater prophet that ever was. And John the Baptist came this way. It says, now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now, while we're studying about Amos in here, the kids in Miss Christa's class who... Uh, Jessica is teaching today, or learning about John the Baptist. And she happened to get down in the Strip District, I believe. If you look real closely, zoom in on the camera. We don't actually have a zoom on there, but um, this is not a locust. This is a cricket. It's not chocolate covered. It's salt and vinegar. So those of you who have kids in Miss Krista's class, they today will have the opportunity to <laughs> taste like chicken. <laughs> I did swallow it. I felt like it wasn't fair to have your kids do something that I wasn't willing to do. But you know what just happened is I got all your attention, didn't I? When you realized what was going on, then you kind of zoomed in. And the Lord used that because in John the Baptist's case, people had grown complacent about religion. Here at the center of God's economy and revelation of his work in the world, well, there's angels in heaven crying Hosanna that salvation has come because of a birth in the city of David, and wise men come from Persia to Jerusalem and say, hey, where's the king of the Jews been born? Because we saw his sign in the heaven. And those who should have known, those who, as Jesus said, studied the scripture because in them you think you found li find life, and they speak of me. And they were unaware. Needed something to kind of shake them up. And I kind of think that's why, I mean, why would the Lord pick John the Baptist? And I wonder why he ate locusts and wild honey and wore camel's hair and a leather belt. Did he think that was cool? Did he figure that, well, that's what most of the kids are doing now, so I'll, you know, they'll, they'll recognize me and, and relate to me. I don't think so. I don't think many people were on that diet and, and doing that. But it got their attention. Hey, do you see the guy down there by the river? He's, he's wearing camel's hair, and it, he's eating locusts and honey. Ugh. It's as bad as Pastor Kevin. eating that salty cricket, and I still taste that salt in my mouth. But it got attention. And not only that, it provided the opportunity for God to demonstrate something that is missed sometimes by us human beings, and that is God calls people. God calls individuals who have certain 
capabilities are born in a certain area of the world in a certain time to certain parents and have a certain DNA sequencing that makes them just the kind of person that they are and go through certain life experiences that mold and shape their heart and their soul and their spirit. And he chooses them. He chooses you and me for very specific things. In the, in the uh, little thing that we saw last week that we showed about Pastor Chuck in the, the interview with him from years back, he was talking about the fact that uh, there are certain people that a pastor can, can minister to and how he felt like, you know, it was about two years in a, in a church uh, that would kind of settle out the people that uh, he could minister to uh, would stay and the people that he couldn't would be gone by then. Right? There are certain individuals that have come to this church and it just didn't connect. It isn't that they're bad or we're bad. It is that, well, we are who we are and they are who they are. And God has built this kingdom to be unique. But he uses your uniqueness. And he uses who you are and where you came from what you know, what you've learned in your life experience, to be able to serve Him and reach out to others in interesting ways, and not always in the way you would expect. Oh, gosh. Personally, me? Well, my testimony is I was a drug-headed hippie and, you know, fried my brains with LSD until the Lord got hold of me. So, I guess I'm called to uh, X LSD hippies. How many X LSD hippies here this morning? Be honest now. Come on, be honest. Okay, there's one. Paul was a gen was a Jew of the Jews, a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Man, one of those strict to the letter of the law, right? And who's he get called to? He becomes the apostle to the Gentiles of all people. It's fascinating. But God was had prepared him for many years for that very ministry. It's interesting. So this morning, if you found your way to the book of Amos, we will find in this section of Scripture that Amos was a farmer and a sheep herder who was called to be a prophet. And in this section, as we finish out the book of Amos, you're going to see some things where he uses some illustrations and so forth that it's what he knows. It's what he knows. And he's challenged in his ministry as a prophet because, you know, who are you? And, well, we'll see what he has to say. So, if you found your way to chapter 6, again, quick refresher on the, the period of time that we're talking about here, this is before the northern kingdom has been overrun by the Assyrians, but that is what Amos and others have been prophesying and warning against and warning the southern kingdom as well. Amos is actually from the southern kingdom, but he's been called to go up and prophesy at Bethel, at this sanctuary of idolatry that had been set up by Jeroboam I, and now under Jeroboam II, many... Uh, generations later, not same family, just same name, it, it, they are, he is prophesying that because of the centuries of idolatry there in the northern kingdom, that the Assyrians are going to overrun them. And so, in chapter 6, verse 1, Amos says, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion, that would be Judah, southern kingdom, and trust in Mount Samaria, that's one of the centers of the northern kingdom, Israel. Notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Kalna and see, and from there go over to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who caused the seed of violence to come near who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. 
who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore they shall now go captive as the first of the captives, and those who recline at banquet shall be removed. The Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. He begins basically by naming three places of the Syrians and Philistines, cities that had already been overrun by Assyria. You see, Israel during this time was in a prosperous time. Both Israel and Judah were feeling pretty prosperous. And the northern kingdom had had some military success. They're feeling their oats. They're feeling like, hey, we, you know, we got it together. God must be blessing us because, man, we've had some military victories. Our uh, economy is doing really well. We've got a strong army. We're doing all right. And he says, hey, these cities were bigger than you are more territory, stronger, and they were overrun. Who do you think you are? You're trusting in something false. It says, stretching out on ivory couches. Now, when I first read this, I'm thinking an ivory couch, like the cushions are ivory, that would not be comfortable. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about couches where the support is ivory. It's very ornate and beautiful. But the couch is, you know, something comfortable to stretch out on. And in fact, archaeological digs up in the northern kingdom area have found uh, Samaritan ivory up in that area uh, from this period of time, confirming yeah, they were living in luxury. They didn't have anybody saying, don't kill the elephants for the ivory. They were going and getting it and making beds and couches out of it. But there's an interesting word here where it says they're stretching out. It literally means like spreading out. This isn't like I think about, oh, I'm stretching out. A kind of, okay, my hands are kind of behind my back. I might, you know, cross my legs and I'm just kind of, ah. No, this is like someone who's in a drunken stupor and just kind of flops all over the couch. That's the image that's here. It says stretching out or spreading out or falling off the edge of the couch. You who are at ease, you're mixing up the wine in the bowls. That's where they would mix wine and dilute wine or add fragrance to it. And then they would pour it into jars to keep it and then pour it into a glass. No, they're just I'm not straight from the bowl, man. I just, I'm just doing it. Right? That's, that's the image here. They're just partying. They're just having a good old time partying and not hearing what the Lord has been saying to them again and again. And most of all, he says, you're busy enjoying pleasure, but you're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. You're not grieved by the sin that has overwhelmed and overrun the nation, the people and the nation as a whole. You know, there are a couple different reactions that we can have in looking at this evil world that we live in. And we're going to find Amos demonstrate some of the right reactions. But one of the things that should happen is we should be grieved. We sang it this morning. Break my heart for what breaks yours. God so loved the world, not part of the world, or the world in the first century, or the world in the 21st century. God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. And when the Lord God Almighty looks down upon this earth and sees what human beings have done to his creation, which he created, and you remember on the first five days of creation, he created something and it says he looked at it. I, I have this image of an artist 
kind of doing it and then stepping back and looking at it. It says, and it was good. Tov. A word in the Hebrew that means a whole lot more than just, oh, good, it's good. You know, for us, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Oh, it's really good. No, good means excellent, amazing, whoa, it's good. And you know what? When he made human beings, he says he looked and he said, it was very good. It was very good. And now he sees his creation made in his likeness an image and how that image has been spoiled and how that image has been marred by sin and by evil. And he has done so much to reach out to man through Jesus Christ. And he looks down and he sees people spitting on the name of the Lord or inventing things that, you know, uh, I got an article this week about some alleged biblical scholar who's, who's written a book that I know will go to the top seller list and he'll make lots of money just like Bart Ehrman has done and so forth, telling lies. And it's that he now has proved that the whole idea of Jesus Christ was made up by a bunch of rich Romans in the first century, which even at just looking from the outside is absolutely ludicrous and absurd because the result of this was not as he intend as this guy proposes he says oh well this was a bunch of rich romans who figured hey this will take care of the jews who were always such a pain in the neck for us well first of all the jews were a pain in the neck for the romans in this little bitty province over in the middle east they were not a problem for the whole empire they had bigger problems they were for focusing on right it was not a big huge thing second of all it was a stupid idea. Oh, let's settle the Jews down by having someone raised up out of the Jews who basically says they shouldn't worship in the temple anymore and he is the Lord God and all of the things that Jesus did to get everything riled up. And then the Roman Empire spent the next three centuries persecuting the Christians. Ah, but they were an invention of Romans. It's absurd. But you know what? The guy will make bazillions of dollars and he will poison the hearts and minds of unsuspecting people who don't know what's really in this book. But they go, oh, well, this guy's got three or four PhDs. He must know. And they'll read that book. They'll buy that book and read it. But this book, it's probably sitting on their shelf and they won't crack it open. And when God looks down and sees that, it breaks his heart. When he sees what we human beings do, it breaks his heart. And when we see what has happened, it should break our hearts. He says, you're at ease. You're just... Well, there's a song on a great album. The album's called Songs of the Generations. And if you don't have it, I know where you can get it. And there's a song on there called Dancing in the Sorrow. And it's speaking about this very thing in the, in the chorus. I can see you dancing in the sorrow. Like you don't know what's going on. I can see you laughing at the storm clouds that are coming. And I think you don't even know what, you don't even know what's going on. Some things don't change, do they? He says, therefore, you're going to be taken captive just as all the others. Just like the first ones go, you'll be following along and following along. And he hated the pride of the nation. And look at this. Verse 9, it shall come to pass that if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. And when a relative of the dead with one who will burn the bodies, picks up the bodies to take them out of the house, and says, are there any more with you? Someone will say, none. And he will say, hold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. Huh? What? Well, there's a couple things in there we could miss. Number one, Jews don't burn bodies. That, that's a desecration of the body. They bury bodies. Uh, Jews today believe that... Um, those who believe in the resurrection believe it'll, it'll start at the Mount of Olives. So those are the most expensive graves to buy. 
is one on the Mount of Olives. You can't, you can't get any. They're stacked up there, literally, stacked one on top of each other because they believe that's, they believe actually that in the resurrection, everyone buried somewhere else is going to come and travel underground and come up out of the Mount of Olives. So I have heard. But they don't, they don't, in this time especially, uh, cremate bodies. But in time of war and in time of being overrun, time of, you know, plague or something like that, that's what you do. So that's the image that's here, that there's someone coming to burn the bodies. And then this whole idea of don't even say the name of the Lord. It's like, don't even think about having a memorial service and praying because this is the judgment of God. That's the, that's the idea that's here. Pretty, pretty ugly to think of. For behold, the Lord gives a command. He will break the great house into bits and the little house into pieces. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into gall and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who rejoice over lo, lo Debar, who say, have we not taken Karnam for ourselves by our own strength? These are the military victories that they've had. But behold, I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts. And they'll afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the valley of the Arabah. He says, hey, look, if you're on a horse, you're not going to go galloping through a, a, a stony area. You know, if you look at the legs on horses, they're actually kind of skinny compared to the weight that they carry, right? And to some degree, horses' legs are rather fragile, to, relatively speaking. So you wouldn't go galloping through a stony field. You wouldn't plow a stony, stony field. And here's where Amos is kind of using some illustrations from what he knows. He's a country boy. He's a farmer. He goes, hey, anybody knows, you know... You don't, uh, you don't go galloping through a stony area with, on a horse or go plowing a stony area. That'd be stupid. But as stupid as that is, you guys are doing something even stupider. You have taken justice and righteousness and poisoned it. You've poisoned it. So what's Amos' reaction to this? Verse one of chapter seven, thus, said, thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, he formed locust swarms. I wonder if they taste any better than crickets. Behold, he formed a locust swarm at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land that I said, O Lord God, forgive, I pray. Oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. And thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. And then I said, O Lord God, cease, I pray. O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. God is long-suffering. The Jews in this day understood the concept that if you live according to righteousness, you will be blessed. What they didn't understand was the concept of God's long-suffering because they saw the fact that they were not yet consumed, the fact that God must think everything's okay with what they're doing. must be okay to build a couple golden calves and set one up at Dan and set one up at Bethel and call it Yahweh and say we're worshiping Yahweh but make up all the ceremonies and all the rituals and so forth and appoint your own priests and kind of do whatever you want and whatever everybody else is doing. Pick a little Babylonian-ish stuff and pick a little Phoenician stuff and oh, we'll sprinkle in a little of this and a little of that. We'll make a really cool religion and it'll be great and we'll like it. We'll have fun. It'll be just wonderful. And it must be okay because God hasn't zapped us dead yet, so he must be okay with it. We are actually pretty prosperous right now. But we got military victories. We got a strong army. We got a strong economy. God must be okay with us. God bless America. Oh, I meant Israel. Or did I? But you see, God is long-suffering. 
But what we will hear in these next passages is God saying, I've had enough. I, 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 it's come to a point. And whether that be in your own personal life, whether that be in the life of a church or a nation, God is merciful and gracious. But there comes a point when He says, okay, you have proven to me that this is really what you want. So I'm going to give it to you. So that you might see the emptiness of that which you are pursuing. I've done that. I've done that. I've chased after some stuff that is empty. And I... God didn't punish me and didn't, you know, kick me out of the kingdom. But He brought me to a place saying, okay, if that's, evidently that's what you really want, okay, I will give it to you. And let you taste a little bit of being separated from me. Let you see what the result of what you are pursuing actually is. And that's the time of the question of, all right, so now what are you going to do? I ran straight back to the Lord God Almighty. I said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. He's so good. He's so good. But there comes that point, and that point had come for the nation of Israel. But what was Amos' reaction, knowing the sin and knowing what God's Word says if you depart from me, this is what you can expect to happen. You find it in Leviticus. You can find it in Deuteronomy. The specifics of what they went through. And what was Amos' reaction when the Lord said, okay, so I'm going to bring in the locusts and they are going to wipe everything out. Right after the king's mowing, which is they would go through and they would do the harvest for the king and then the people could go into the fields and glean from what was on the edges and so forth. And they say, no, right after the king's mowing, going through so nobody's going to have anything to eat. They're going to eat up everything. And Amos didn't say, yeah, go get them, Lord. He said, no, be merciful. And interceded for them. So it says God relented. In the, Old Test, in the Old King James, it says repented. Not in the sense that God had sinned and was repenting of sin, but in the same way that when we repent, what it means is we change our mind. And because we change our mind, we head in a different direction. God changed His mind. Because one interceded on their behalf. All right, fire. I'll just burn them out. Again, Amos intercedes. God's teaching this church about prayer. And Thursday nights has been a wonderful time of God's teaching. I encourage you, whether you are here or whether you can't be in this room, this is the room where we gather together to pray, if you can't be here on a Thursday night at 7 o'clock, make that a time of prayer. Set that time apart as holy. That's what holy means. Be set apart. Set it apart and say, 7 o'clock on Thursdays, Wherever I am, with my family, whatever it is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some time and pray. And pray for Calvary Chapel. And pray for the Lord's will in this church and from this church and the needs of people that you know within this church or outside of this church. Pray for the needs of Pittsburgh that we might have an even more positive influence and effect on this city and see people's lives changed for the kingdom. Pray. Because God moves when we pray. Now, I confess to you, I don't understand that. I've been a Christian for over 30 years and I still don't fully understand it. But wait, God's God. I'm going to make God change His mind? God's will cannot be changed. God's will is immutable. I'm going to change it? How does that? I don't know. But here's Amos, and that's what happened. You can find the same kind of thing when you look at the story of Moses. You can look at the story of others who have prayed and God moved in a different direction because of that prayer. 
It's not because of us. We don't direct God. We don't get to tell him what to do. But somehow, as we go to the Lord in prayer and we pour out our hearts and we have the right attitude of seeing the sin and the degradation and the evil of this world, and as we cry out to God to deliver us, Hosanna, save us. And Lord, save these poor, ignorant people who are sinning and caught up in it and don't know it. They don't know you. Lord, be merciful on them. Save them too. Save them too. That's what calls us for. Amos doesn't plead that the nation is innocent or not that bad. He just pleads for the mercy and the promises of God. He stood on the promise of God here that God would not destroy utterly destroy Israel. And he stood on that promise. He said, Jacob's too small, you do that, Lord, and you, you'll totally wipe him out. And I know that's your promise is that you won't that, let that happen. There will be a remnant. So what does God do? Huh, check this out. Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Plumb line. Everybody know what a plumb line is. It's basically a string or a rope with a weight on the bottom, and you hold it up, and when you do that, that weight at the bottom, uh, because it has a small mass, is attracted to the center of the earth thanks to gravity. And so it gets what we consider to be a straight line. And you set things up that way. You make a building. You determine whether it's straight or not by that plumb line. And here it says the Lord is standing on a wall made with a plumb line, meaning it's straight with a plumb line in his hand. It's straight. And he's not going to send the locust. He's not going to send the fire. But he's going to put a plumb line in the midst of his people to say, okay, here it is. Do you measure up? Here is what you are to measure up to. Do you? How do you align with what God's Word says? There's a story when the uh, Babylonians came, or, or when the uh, 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 Medo-Persians took over the Babylonians. Remember the story from the book of Daniel, and Belteshazzar was having a feast, and they're partying, just like in this story. You're just partying, you don't even know what's going on. The armies of the Medo-Persians were inside the walls of the city before they even knew it. They are just partying. But before that, a hand wrote on the wall. You remember? What did it say? You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Right? Yeah, there's a certain weight we're expecting. Put in the balance. Okay, I'm going to put the weight here, and when I put you here, it ought to balance. Whoa, wait a minute. What's wrong? I'm going to set the plumb line. There it is. That's how you should be. Oh, wait. What's wrong? This is our plumb line. This is it. It's right here. And I can tell you I'm twisted and bent. But by God's grace, He's aligning me. And He aligns each one of us to His plumb line. But He sets that in our midst. And that's what He's saying. I'm going to set the plumb line in the midst. You're going to know. The rest of the chapter, uh, this priest, not a priest... Uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, but a priest in the sanctuary of the I idols in Bethel, Am Amaziah, complains. Hey, what are, you, what are you doing? You know? And he complains to the king, Jeroboam. He says, hey, Am Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. He's saying these bad things. And Amaziah said to Amos, verse 12, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. Get out of here. Go back to your hometown. There eat bread and prophesy. And never prophesy again at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. It's the royal residence. Who do you think you are? 
And Amos said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. I didn't go to prophet university. I didn't go to prophet grad school. I don't even have a prophet GED. I was a sheep breeder, a tender of sycamore fruit. And then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you say, do not prophesy against Israel, do not spout against the house of Isaac. Well, here you go. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city, your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword, your land shall be divided by survey line, you shall die in a defiled land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. I can only prophesy, the prophet said, what the Lord says for me to prophesy. You don't want me to prophesy? Too bad, Amaziah. And oh, by the way, you're going to be overrun by the Assyrians, taken captive. Your children are going to be killed. Your wife is going to be left in this city destitute and become a prostitute in order to survive. Verse 8, thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And Amos, being a smart guy, said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. That's the second time he said that. I'm not just going to walk by and go, yeah, I really don't like that, but okay. His long suffering has come to an end. I will not pass by anymore. The songs of their temple shall be wailing in that day. That's their temples up in the northern kingdom, not the, uh, not the temple down in the south. Many dead bodies everywhere. They'll be thrown out in silence. He goes on and, and through this chapter talks about how they were kind of basically a church going, when's it going to be over? I got things to do. I, I, I need to go out and make some money. I would rather work than be here in the New Moon Festival or on the Sabbath. And why can't I just go out and make some money? And he says they were taking the making the ephaph smaller and the shekel bigger. Now, you might not understand what that means until you consider the fact that an ephah is a measurement of grain and a shekel is money. So basically they were shorting people, you know, uh, selling less for more, making their money on the poor, making their money on the poor. So down in verse 11, there's, of chapter 8, there's an interesting statement. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east, shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord but shall not find it. And in that day, the fair virgins or the young girls and strong young men shall faint from thirst. And those who swear by the sin of Samaria, meaning the golden idols, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, the golden idol, and as the way of Beersheba lives, the golden idol, it shall fall and never rise again. A famine of hearing the words of the Lord. When he talked about summer fruit, it's the last fruit of the season. And basically he was saying, Israel, your fruitfulness is past. That's it. It's, it's all the fruit possible has come from you. It's over. It's time to replow the field. And the day is coming. And I believe this is one of those areas of Scripture that is looking at the present and looking at the future. It's looking at the present of Amos' day and saying the days are coming when there will be a famine in the land in that not a famine of bread, that's not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about of hearing the word of God. Now notice it says of hearing the word of God, hearing the words of the Lord. This isn't saying there won't be the word of the Lord around. This is people won't hear it. Matthew 13, verses 14 and 15 are a quote from Isaiah. And Jesus explains why he told parables. And he quotes this scripture passage, which says this. 
Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn or repent, so that I should heal them. I think probably today there are more Bibles in circulation in this world than at any time in the history of mankind. I would be willing to uh, say that there are probably more churches in the world today than ever in the history of mankind. More teachings, more places to get teaching. You can get it on the internet. You came here Sunday morning. You can get it on your iPhone. You can get it on your iPad. You can get it on your i-whatever. There's more Christian music that's being played today than ever that I know of, and in more opportunities. There's more of all of those things, and there's less hearing the Word of God. Jesus said it like this. He said, let him who has ears to hear, hear. You see, in this day and age, you, you can't believe how many things I get in the mail, both at home and here, from people I've never known before, organizations I've never known before, but they got my name, they got Calvary Chapel's name, and it's for the latest conference on this and on that and on something else. And they might be really good things. They might be, you know, wolves in sheep's clothing. I can't tell from a glossy photo, okay? But I get, I would say, on average, maybe a half a dozen a week of something that's going on somewhere. And people are running to and fro and they're looking for the Word of God. But you know what they're doing? They're looking for the words that will justify their behavior. I want to find something that is good for me. Now, like I said before, you know what? My particular style of teaching the, the person that God has made me, well, there's some people that just can't stand that. They're good people. They love Jesus. They don't, don't hate me, but they just really can't take the way I teach. Okay. Go and get plugged in somewhere where you can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. It isn't about that. There are those running around looking for the content that makes them feel good. I don't feel uncomfortable in this church. He never talks about sin. I like that. He doesn't talk about hell either. I don't even know if he believes in hell. I like that. It's kind of comfortable. It says, in the last days there will be those who have itchy ears and pastors will tickle it. Just going to tell you what you want. It's one of the wonderful things about being part of the Calvary Chapel movement and following Pastor Chuck's model of teaching all the way through the Bible is I don't get to pick and choose. I don't get to just go, well, we're just going to talk about the nice stuff. Just going kind to of talk about the easy stuff. And that keeps me from being uh, tempted to not say things that might offend you. God gave me the blessing of working full-time as well as pastoring. And that is a blessing on many levels. And one of them is, I am not tempted, as I can imagine some pastors might be, who's salary are dependent upon the giving of the church to be careful about what they say. And I don't judge those men because if I were in that situation, I'm not sure where I would stand. But God's so good, he just built a wall there and said, ah, oh, no, 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 you work. That way, that one's taken care of. You don't have to fall into that one. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. A lot of people run around looking for a place where they can feel good. And as you begin to ignore the Word of God, but still seeking religiosity, there are kind of two ways you can go. You either head towards ceremony and ritual, things that I can do that are religious that will take care of that. I feel real religious when I do these things. Now, ceremonies in and of themselves are not necessarily bad. We have ceremonies here. 
they're maybe not as high and mighty as some other liturgical uh, fellowships and so forth, but we do pretty much the same thing every Sunday. Have you noticed if you've been here more than one Sunday, it's, we have pretty much, you know, that's the way we do it, right? There's nothing wrong with ceremony per se, but when it begins to be the thing to fill up the void, because I'm not aligning with that plumb line. That's one direction. The other direction is liberalism, which is basically, okay, well, I'll make up the rules. You know, that Bible, that's an ancient book. That was written by people who didn't have computers, so how smart could they be, right? So I think what they really meant here was this, or actually, that probably wasn't even in there. So we'll just ignore that one, right? Here's the part I don't know if I can get through. Verse 13 of chapter 8, it says, In that day, the fair virgins, that means the young girls, and the strong young men shall faint from thirst. In that day when there is a void of hearing the word of God, by those who are mature enough and should know enough to hear and listen. And they will live their lives and they will speak in ways that will pass on to the next generation an emptiness, an empty shell of a faith. It's the kids. It's the next generation. We are one generation away from total apostasy and total anti-Christianness. One generation, that's all it takes. And if we as adults are not faithful in honestly passing on the truth, who will? I'll tell you who will. Not the truth, but someone will pass on a lie. Guaranteed. It's up to us. In whatever sphere that the Lord has put us in, as a parent, Man, you got a congregation right there, and they're a tough congregation, let me tell you. At work, in your neighborhood, wherever it is, and being to pass on what the truth is. In chapter 9, Amos basically says it's going to overtake all, but he ends on a message of hope, and I want to leave you with this. Verse 13 of chapter 9 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. And I will bring back the captives of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. And they shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. And I will plant them in their land. And no longer shall they be pulled up from the land that I have given them says the Lord your God. Ooh-wee. Wow. Something happened in 1948 where, you know, Israel became a nation again, I heard. And he says that there will be a time of great, such great abundance. And again, we see Amos the farmer here going, you know what? The plowman shall overtake the reaper. Eh, okay, what does that mean? That means they won't be busy, they won't be finished harvesting and it'll be time to start plowing and planting again. Because there's still fruitfulness in the spring when usually you should be getting ready for next year's crop. That's what he's saying there. Abundance. That is the promise of the Lord for the remnant. That is the promise of the Lord for you and me is an abundant life. But there is a plumb line that he sets in our midst, and that plumb line is right here. And we are called to adjust ourselves to it. We're bent. We're broken. We're twisted. We're leading a little to the left, a little to the right. And what God calls us to do is to look honestly at this plumb line and align ourselves to him, to hear what he's saying. To not just listen to the words that come through that we've heard a whole bunch of times, but to hear what the Lord God is saying and be changed by it and live. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the 
the encouragement and challenge both that it is to us. Lord, I pray that you would take these words from Amos and that you would challenge us and encourage us with them, Lord. That you do love us and that you are willing to change your mind as we intercede on behalf of those who are lost. That, Lord, you have set a standard in our midst and you invite us and you equip us to align ourselves with that standard. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have. Help us, Lord, to find the way, the words to speak, the songs to sing, the things to write that will spread that hope throughout this world and especially to the next generation. Thank you, Lord, that you have made the way for us. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, grant you peace. May he lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you each and every day of your life through Jesus Christ who is our Lord and our Savior and our King who is arriving real soon. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.